Welcome to our online talk with historian John Sears titled Eleanor Roosevelt and the Drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Today's event is hosted by the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. My name is Kelly Douglas. I'm a white female with long blonde hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a black shirt. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the communications director for the FDR committee, and I will serve as today's facilitator. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping tips. We do have two ASL interpreters on today's call, Cheryl and Travis. We are presenting in gallery view, so the interpreter should always be visible. You do not need to pin them. If you were to pin the current interpreter, it could prevent you from seeing the active interpreter after an interpreter change. Captions are available in Zoom. Click show subtitle in your Zoom menu bar to turn them on. We will be sharing a short audio clip that will have closed captioning. You do not need to be on Zoom to access the call. We will read all questions out loud so that the content will be available to individuals calling in on the phone or who cannot see any visual content. The call is being recorded and we will be and will be posted on our website for future use. We will have a Q&A session toward the end of the discussion. You can submit your questions in the Q&A tab located on the bottom of your menu bar. You can email me at kelly at kdrcommunications.com. I will put my email in the chat box as well. You can also press star nine if you are dialing into the call and it will notify me you have a question. We ask that you please do reserve this option as an accommodation for people who need it or are only on the telephone. Now that we have covered those important points, we can get started with our program. It is my pleasure to introduce Mary Dolan, co-founder and executive director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, who will moderate today's event. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee uh, we call it FDR Committee for short. I want to thank the FDR Committee team uh, that has helped put this event on. I'm Mary Dolan, co-founder and executive director of the FDR Committee. I'm a white woman with graying blonde hair, shoulder length, a uh, black sweater on today with a little green collar, um, uh, and I use she and her. Um, the FDR Committee is the friends group for the FDR Memorial in Washington, DC. I hope you've all been there. Uh, we are born out of the fight for representation at the FDR Memorial. We were established in 2019 to ensure that the disability history of the Memorial was not forgotten. We help educators teach the disability story of the FDR Memorial about the campaign for the wheelchair statue and about FDR's disability and its influence on his leadership. Also, we work with other organizations to ensure un other underrepresented narratives of the FDR and Eleanor story are a part of the memorial experience. We are also dedicated to the full inclusion at the memorial and are pressing for long overdue accessibility improvements. And we strive to ensure that the memorial itself is preserved for future generations. Education, inclusion, preservation, that is what we're about. I invite you to learn more about us at our website, www.fdr for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, memoriallegacy.com. That's fdrmemoriallegacy.com. And we will put that in the chat. Uh, this event is part of our education and awareness program. And I ask that you uh, consider supporting our work with a tax deductible donation. If you go to our website, again, www.fdrmemoriallegacy.com, you'll see the yellow donate button in the top right. And guess what? You could also text to give, which is really, really pretty cool. Um, and you know your cell phone is probably right by you. Um, so you pick it on up and you, you dial 202-858-1233 and you text FDR. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so I've done it. I've donated both ways. I have not been hacked. Um, it's safe. It's secure. Uh, and we hope that you'll consider doing that. Um, we're striving to meet a challenge grant that has been very generously given to us from the Gordon and Laura Gund Foundation. 
Um, Mr. Gund uh, donated a large sum of money to help make the wheelchair statue a reality. And we are at the tail end of this challenge grant. We need $40,000 more in order to get his full match. That means every dollar you give is matched up to $40,000. So look, if you care about the FDR Memorial, if you care about preserving disability history, or if, if even you enjoy this event, even just a little bit, um, consider making a, a donation, even a small one is most welcome. Now onto our program. Uh, we're gonna turn our attention to Eleanor Roosevelt. She is a legend any day of the week, but why are we talking about her now, why today? Uh, it's because 75 years ago, in April of 1946, Mrs. Roosevelt was named the chair of the drafting committee for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We decided to take a moment to honor this anniversary, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, it's, it's not only just because, you know, we like all things Roosevelt, but because Eleanor Roosevelt was a champion of disabled people. And the document that she she helped get written, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights served as the foundation for our disability community's own UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Disability rights are human rights. And the FDR Memorial Wheelchair Statue is a testament to the, to the advancement of those rights and the need to fight for them. I'm pleased to have with me today, John Sears, John is the former executive director of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute. He was associate editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers Project. Uh, his book, Refuge Must Be Given, Eleanor, the Jewish Plight, and the Founding of Israel. That book is coming out next month. Um, so welcome, John. But before we ask you to share your thoughts and scholarship with us, we're going to get ourselves in the zone here and I'm going to play a short audio clip of the one and only Eleanor Roosevelt talking about the Declaration of Human Rights. So if you give me a moment while I get the proverbial needle on the record here. I'm going to read you the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, therefore, the General Assembly proclaims this Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations, to the end that every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind, shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms, and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance. All right. Well, so that is the former first lady herself, and I would like to now invite John Sears, PhD, please share with us some wisdom and scholarship about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who uh, I just read earlier today, according to the Gallup poll in the 50s and maybe even the 40s and into the early 60s was always consistently listed as uh, the most um, um, influential and revered and admired uh, woman in America. So John, if you would. Thank you, Mary. It's uh, good to be here. Um, and it's good to have all of you out there in Zoom land with me. One of the advantages of Zoom land is that if I were giving this talk in Washington or Hyde Park, New York, many of you probably wouldn't be here. So despite the um, the drawbacks of Zoom. It's nice to have you here. Um, I urge you to visit the FDR Memorial in Washington. Not everybody visits, visits it because it's a little out of the way. It's not on the mall. So if you haven't been there, I urge you to go there. Um, it's a wonderful park-like memorial, which includes an honoring of Eleanor. So um, Eleanor Roosevelt regarded her role in drafting and adopting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as her greatest achievement. 
I'm gonna talk a little later about why that might be so. First, I'm gonna tell you something about how she became chair of the Commission on Human Rights, which drafted the declaration and describe something about the drafting process um, that she guided. And finally, some of the reasons why Eleanor Roosevelt was so successful in this very difficult task. And then in conversation with Mary, we can talk a bit about the legacy of the declaration. I will sometimes refer to Eleanor Roosevelt as ER. She began to sign her letters to Franklin Roosevelt uh, ER in 1909. And uh, using that usage sort of puts her on the same playing field as FDR, where she belongs. Um, she was appointed to the first American delegation to the United Nations in 1945 by President Harry Truman. Um, she was a little reluctant at first to accept it. She had no um, diplomatic, international diplomatic experience. Uh, but she soon proved herself uh, wrong about her lack of credentials. Um, the, the rest of the delegation was a very distinguished bipartisan group of men, including the secretary, the then secretary of state, James Burns, um, John Foster Dulles, who was a future secretary of state. Um, and they were not impressed with Eleanor Roosevelt's appointment. They thought it was a, a ploy by Harry Truman to capitalize on Franklin Roosevelt's popularity and, and on Eleanor Roosevelt's popularity. She was a very popular as well as controversial figure. Um, and they assigned her to the third committee, which dealt with social humanitarian and cultural affairs where, as she put it, they didn't think she could do much harm. Well, the first issue to come before the General Assembly at its first meeting in London was the issue of the displaced persons who were in camps in Germany where they had fled um, the advance of the Soviet Union. They'd fled from Eastern Europe or had been liberated from Nazi concentration camps. And um, Eleanor Roosevelt being on the third committee, which dealt with issues re like refugees, uh, debated this issue with the Soviet representative in the third committee, where, as she put it, she won hands down. And then she debated it again in the General Assembly against Andrei Vashinsky, who was a very tough uh, diplomat. He had presided over the show trials in the Soviet Union in the late 30s. And she uh, defeated Vashinsky as well. Um, that established her reputation as an international stateswoman to be reckoned with. Dulles, who had been skeptical of her appointment, said afterwards, I feel I must tell you that when you were appointed, I thought it terrible. But now I think your work has been just fine. So against the odds, Eleanor Roosevelt told her future biographer, Joe Lash, the women inch forward. When the Commission of Human Rights selected Eleanor Roosevelt chair, she was undertaking a very challenging job. There were 18 members on the commission. They spoke different languages. They came from different uh, philosophical and legal traditions. Um, different religious backgrounds, um, and they were going to have to agree on what rights should go in this declaration. Eleanor Roosevelt was not a principal drafter of the declaration. That, that was undertaken by John Humphrey, who was a Canadian law professor, who, um, who was the secretary to the commission, and Rene Cassin, who was a French lawyer who had had practice uh, drafting legislation, which was very important in this process. At the first meeting of the commission in January of 1947, Humphrey provided a list of rights, um, which he had gathered from previous, previous bills of rights or proposed bills of rights. Um, and 
Eleanor Roosevelt suggested that they go through that list and decide, you know, which of these rights should belong in the Declaration. Um, and when that session in concluded, um, the, a smaller drafting committee asked Humphrey to, to prepare a, a first draft of the Declaration based on the discussion in the full commission. Um, they then asked um, René Cassin to take that draft and revise it in the light of discussions within the drafting committee. And what he did was he put it into a more logical structure um, and added a preamble and six principles, which sort of gave meaning to the articles that followed. Um, and much of that, much of that, those two drafts uh, survived the long process of revision. But the process of revision was very long and very thorough. Um, and the completed declaration was the result of re the repeated interrogation of each word and phrase at every stage of the drafting process. Eleanor Roosevelt's contribution to that process was that she was a very disciplined moderator. She kept steering the discussions back to the article under discussion. These were the, the men on the commission were from different, they liked to philosophize and they would get off into philosophical issues and ideological issues. And she would bring them back to the article under discussion and how it was to be worded. Um, she said after the second session of the, of the commission that she was, a, she was a hard taskmaster. I drove them hard, she said. She kept them working from early morning until after midnight. This was, these were two week sessions of the, of the full commission, but they're glad now it's over and all the men are proud of their accomplishment. She made one other very important contribution which that she insisted that the declaration be written in a style that could in her words, be readily understood by ordinary men and women. She worked to to eliminate legal language that a layperson would find obscure. Let me give you an example of that. An early draft of the declaration uh, contains an early article in the declaration contains the term legal personality. It was a term that Cassin had introduced into the article uh, translated from the French. Um, that's the kind of thing that made this so difficult. People were translating terms from their own language into English and, um, and then those terms didn't necessarily translate. Um, so the, the article began, everyone has the right to a legal personality everywhere. Eleanor Roosevelt objected. She said the term legal personality might have meaning to a lawyer, but it would not have meaning to the layman. So the committee, after a long discussion, revised that article to read, everyone has the right to a status in law and to the enjoyment of fundamental civil rights. It went through further revision over the 18 month drafting process and it finally appeared in article six in still more accessible language. It reads, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. So that's just a capsule. I mean, every word, every phrase was, was interrogated in this way and revised and revised and refined over that period and argued over. Um, there were also ideological differences that Eleanor Roosevelt had to manage. Um, there was the question of including economic and social rights in the declaration. Uh, the, the Bill of Rights, the American Bill of Rights and the French um, Declaration of the Rights of Man only contained civil and political rights. But the, um, the newly developed, the newly independent nations, the developing nations felt that th those rights um, would have very little meaning to people who were illiterate, who, who couldn't, didn't have enough to eat, um, whose health was uh, not taken care of. And so it was very important to those nations that economic and social rights, the right to education, the right uh, to healthcare and so forth were included in the declaration. 
And the communist nations um, believed that their system was going to be more effective in, in delivering economic and social rights. So they were also in favor of, of it. Eleanor Roosevelt, um, well, first of all, the State Department was not keen on including economic and social rights because they believed that, that things like healthcare and um, education were not rights, they were uh, goals that the government might facilitate but not guarantee. Eleanor Roosevelt felt differently. During the New Deal, like her husband, she had come to believe that government had a role in uh, not only a, a role, but an obligation to provide uh, education, healthcare, uh, and other, um, other ingredients of a viable life to, to their citizens. So she was also in favor of including economic and social rights, despite the views of her, of her State Department. The other issue was the relationship between the individual and the state. Um, Western educated members of the, the committee like uh, Charles Malik from Lebanon, who was um, a philosophy professor originally, um, and Eleanor Roosevelt and, and, and Rene Cassin all believed that governments existed for the benefit of the individual. But the communist nations like the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia who were both represented on the commission believed that governments um, existed for the benefit of the group. Um, and so um, the, um, the Soviets and the Yugoslavians kept pounding away at the, in, the obligations of the individual to the state during the, the, uh, the long process of revision. There were also the problems which, with the tactics that the Soviet representatives employed. One problem was that the representatives kept changing. So um, whereas most of the members of the commission were you know, the same representative through this two, 18 two month period. Um, so each time a new Soviet representative came on, they had to get up to speed again. But they also, even then, kept repeatedly raising the same issues. It is slightly annoying, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote in her My Day column, to start at the very beginning each time you meet and cover the same ground all over again. She also clashed with her own State Department, uh, some of whom didn't think there should be a declaration at all. And uh, one of the political problems of this declaration was that a declaration in which there was a strong anti-discrimination clause or article would not be very welcome in the Jim Crow South or in other parts of the United States because of American discrimination against its African-American population. So um, the State Department was reluctant to, uh, to have a declaration, some of them. Um, but, um, Fortunately, a declaration does not have to come before the Senate for ratification. We'll come back to that issue later on. Despite these problems, Eleanor Roosevelt managed to steer the Commission on Human Rights to the completion of its task. How did she do it? She had no legal training, no expert knowledge of parliamentary procedure as she readily admitted herself. She didn't even have a college degree. As a teenager, she'd gone to the Allenswood School in England, um, where she, which really laid the foundation for her interest in human rights. The head of the school was a French feminist named Madame Souvestre, um, who, um, who thought that the girls under her charge should learn about political and social issues and think for themselves, think independently. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt also brought this shrewd understanding of human nature and the skills she'd acquired through the long struggle in her own country, her engagement in the civil rights movement, uh, in women's rights, um, in the rights of uh, people to unemployment and so on. Um, she also had one other gift, which I think is very important to understanding Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Jacob Blaustein, who 
who worked with her when she was at the UN noted that behind an attentive, innocent expression, Eleanor Roosevelt possessed a thoroughly practical mind capable of unsuspected toughness. And you could see that in the way she managed the Commission on Human Rights. Much like Socrates, he recalled, she would ask questions in a tentative manner, hesitating, often professing ignorance. And by this gentle strategy, she often extracted a yes or a maybe where a frontal attack would have produced a no. Blaustein quoted a State Department diplomat who after watching Eleanor Roosevelt display this talent remarked, never has anyone seen naivete and skill so gracefully blended. The commission completed the drafting of the declaration in June of 1948, but the process wasn't over. It then went to the third committee where it was reviewed uh, again, every article was debated all over again in 85 working sessions, 170 amendments were introduced. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was then just representing her country in the third committee, but she was also writing her My Day column, which she'd started writing in 1936. It was a daily column, very, very widely syndicated. And she reported on what was going on in the third committee. And she was not happy with this uh, process, she felt that while the declaration might have flaws, it might not be perfect. If you kept messing with it, you might make it, make it worse rather than better. Finally, that process came to an end and the third committee voted 29 to zero with seven abstentions, including the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Saudi Arabia, and South Africa to adopt uh, the declaration. It then went to the General Assembly. Uh, and in, when Eleanor Roosevelt uh, spoke to the General Assembly, urging them to adopt the Universal Declaration, she noted the importance of keeping, in her words, clearly in mind the basic character of the document. It is not a treaty, she said. It is not an international agreement. It is not, it does not purport to be a statement of law or legal obligation. It is a declaration of basic principles of human rights and freedoms to serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations. As she noted in my day, a document created by 58 nations is apt not to seem perfect to any one of them. Nevertheless, she believed it may well become the International Magna Carta of all men everywhere. That turned out to be very true for the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights became the foundation of the human rights movement that followed its adoption. So I'm gonna stop there and um, Mary and I will now have a conversation, uh, perhaps talking some about the, the uh, legacy of the declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, that was tremendous. Um, one of the things that just struck me, um, and I think it's perhaps in that non-assuming way that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt spoke, uh, and you just said it, she was reciting the things that the Declaration of Human Rights is not. Um, uh, but she gave it one line that hopefully it will be the International Magna Carta. Um, what, what does that exactly mean? What, can you give us a, a, a thumbnail sketch of, of what did the declaration yield? I mean, it was, it, it's a nice statement, but it, it most certainly was more than just uh, just that. So can you sort of give us a little texture on that? Well, you might remember that the Magna Carta is, is the, 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 the origin of Anglo-American law. So out of that Magna Carta, which was not a legally binding document either, it, you can trace all the development of Anglo-Saxon law. So 
Uh, and that's what's happened uh, in international law, that uh, the um, Commission on Human Rights was also working on a convention on human rights at the same time that they were working on the declaration. They didn't complete it until later, um, but some of them uh, were, were working on it and they divided it into two different conventions, one on political and civil rights and one on economic and social rights, uh, largely for the reasons that I said, because the, the, the United States you know, State Department was not going to accept a convention on economic and social rights as a legally binding international document. So uh, there many conventions uh, have been drafted since then, as Mary mentioned, the, the one on disability rights, there's one on women's rights, there's one on children's rights. Um, and um, so that's one legacy of the UN. Uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it was also uh, converted into, uh, you find it in, in constitutions of some of the new independent nations um, incorporated into their, their systems. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, the declaration has inspired and given authority to numerous non-governmental human rights groups like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch that are, are there really to try to, uh, to fulfill the goals of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights through various methods. And um, I might say that the, they have, may have been more effective than the conventions in actually implementing uh, some of the rights. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, because I think that's, um, you know, one of the things is, um, you know, in our country, sometimes um, not everybody um, always appreciates the, the hard work that is done at the United Nations um, and that these documents do take, do have meaning, they do have life, they do create change. Um, and so this is really important to honor. Um, before we go to our, um, if I can, audience, uh, studio audience questions, um, I, I just want to sort of, sort of a point of personal privilege, and then if John, if you'd just comment on it, um, I guess being a, a woman also of a, of a certain age, certainly, um, uh, obviously, thank God, you know, I'm still here, so I'm younger than Eleanor Roosevelt, but I'm, uh, I was really relating to the things that, um, she was, uh, you know, say, or, or things that you were saying about her, about her feeling unsure about herself, um, how she mentioned how she would be nervous um, before speaking. Um, it's hard to imagine that. Um, it's hard to imagine um, her not being absolutely secure and masterful in every moment. Um, and I can also appreciate her use of, of a, can you, uh, that comment, I think naivete of where it really isn't naivete, but it's a, it's a coyness of, well, well, help me understand. And um, I am sure that she was dealing with, um, as we now call mansplaining. <laughs> uh, could you imagine what she had to deal with? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, she probably uh, used that to her advantage, and it um, it it really struck me. Um, so I was wondering if you might comment on 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 how she she conducted herself and sort of knew the male character and and how to work it. Well, I think you know. I mean, she was a human being, so people are nervous in various situations, and she, you know, she was a. a, a felt unloved as a child. She felt she was an outsider. Um, she was an orphan. Um, so she had a lot to overcome. Um, she also had a very high voice, <laughs> which she had to work on. She actually had a, a voice instructor who helped her modify her, her voice. Um, and she worked very hard to become more effective. And, um, and she she still at times was was nervous. I one thing I didn't mention about her her 
her skills was that she was fluent in French. Mm -hmm. And she had learned French as a child um, from French um, nannies. And uh, then she'd gone to Allenswood School where the headmistress was French, uh, a French woman who, who took Eleanor traveling in France uh, during vacations because, I mean, Eleanor had no parents to go back to. And um, she would let Eleanor do all the organizing, you know, all the ordering of meals, the making hotels arrangements and so forth. So by the time, um, you know, and French is a very useful diplomatic language, and particularly when you're dealing with René Cassin in, in your drafting committee. So uh, there's a point at which she, she uh, there's a word eventually in an article and she says to Cassin, well, that's not a good translation of the French which was le cas échéant. Um, and, you know, her French was apparently better than his English. So, um, and then she gave, she gave a, 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 a talk uh, at the Sorbonne in French at the beginning of the opening of the General Assembly in the fall of 1948 about human rights. And this was a very, the State Department wanted her to do this because of the, there was a, a point of very high tension in the Cold War. And she, she wrote it herself. She had to get it vetted by the State Department and they had certain requirements, but she, she even ad-libbed some of it at times. And um, she says about that, she says, I was very nervous before, before that speech. But as I was listening to the people who spoke before me, I was so moved by the, uh, the wonderful ability of the French language to express things that were hard to express in other languages. And <laughs> then she got up and you know, gave this brilliant speech. Uh, and so, um, yeah, she had very impressive skills, but she could also be she could also be nervous. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's one answer to your question. Thank you. No, that's that vulnerability just, you know, that's where that our human connections often just um, really grow from. Uh, we have so many wonderful questions uh, that also came in before uh, we even hit hit start on this uh, webinar and some questions that are coming in now. Kelly, um, would you like to uh, read off one of them, please? Sure, uh, let me just remind everybody the different ways you can submit your questions. Um, you can submit them in the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your menu bar. Feel free to actually put them in the chat as well. I'm monitoring the chat so I can pull them from there. You could also email your questions to kelly at kdrcommunications.com, and I will put that email in the chat again, or press star nine if you're dialing into the call uh, to raise your hand. Just a few ways you can do that. So I am actually going to start with a question that we received prior to the event um, when we received a registration. And a similar question was actually asked in the chat. So the question is, how do we in the 21st century implement the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into law and hold our governments accountable to the UDHR? Well, I, I think it has to do with citizen action. You know, Black Lives Matter, you know, um, Last week, we um, really, for the first time, held a, uh, a white police officer accountable for um, murdering um, an African-American, um, an unarmed African-American. So um, that was progress. I mean, we have a, a, a long way to go in, in, in that area particularly. And, um, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, every generation has to struggle for human rights. And it's preeminently a field in which to stand still is to retreat. So we're never gonna be done with this struggle, but um, 
I think the, the difficulty of law, I mean, the conventions on human rights are legally binding international documents, but how well do they work? Um, the United States has only ratified three of the nine conventions on human rights. Um, and that's because the United States has sort of traditionally been reluctant to give up any of its sovereignty to an international body. And um, it took us 40 years to, to uh, ratify the Convention on Genocide, which was passed, adopted by the UN the same year as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 40 years, genocide. Um, we have, we're the only nation out of 177 who have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, now, many of the nations who've ratified that convention and the other conventions um, have not lived up to their obligations. They still um, repress free speech. They uh, don't recognize the rights of women. They torture, they even commit genocide. So what, you know, the convention, having ratified the convention is pretty meaningless. Um, the United States, on the other hand, has made progress in implementing the principles of some of these conventions um, while not having ratified them. And, and the, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities is a good example because the Americans for Disability Act, which was passed in 1990, after a long struggle um, for disability rights, um, inspired in part by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, has had a profound effect on um, modifying the architecture of American buildings so that they are accessible to everyone um, and, uh, and removing other barriers to people with disabilities so that they can participate fully in, uh, in employment and uh, other aspects of American life. So um, it's an ongoing struggle. And um, I think the most effective um, in our country, it, it's not really laws. Laws are the result of of organization, of organizing people at the grassroots who care deeply about something. And when there are enough of them who do that long enough, then laws can be changed. And um, so I think that's, uh, and we're trying to do that right now. You know, we're trying to get some laws passed that will uh, make police more accountable, for example. So that's, that's the way I think uh, we can make progress. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we received also another question that came in prior to the event. Could you please explain Mrs. Roosevelt's strategy to build relationships within the committee by inviting them to her home for tea and the Soviet practice of inviting committee members to vodka parties? <laughs> well, um... Yeah, she, she liked personal diplomacy and she was a very charming person. When she came into a room, she lit it up. And, um, you know, her presence uh, warmed people. And um, she tried very hard with the Soviet representatives to get to know them as people, but it was very hard because they were, they were trained uh, not to give away much about themselves. They often came in pairs, so one was watching the other in case they, you know, slipped up and said something that they shouldn't have. Or, uh, and, um, you know, in, in the committee, they wouldn't compromise. They didn't believe in compromise. It sounds a little like one of our political parties right now. Um, and um, so, yeah, she, she, invited them to tea, she invited other delegates to tea and she got to know them personally. And um, it was something her husband also believed in that, that he thought he could charm people, even Stalin, you know, not very successfully, but 
he thought he, he could. Um, and as far as the Soviets and vodka are concerned, uh, I think that's um, probably just it comes out of a Russian tradition and uh, um, you probably needed to drink a lot of vodka in order to be a communist. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, um, is there anything on record about her putting down a few shots to try and get the Soviets to ease up on their uh, no, she 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 was not. She was alcohol was something she didn't uh, imbibe. She, her her father had been an alcoholic. Her brother was an alcoholic. She she was very upset by people who drank and drank who drank heavily. So okay. um, she would not have welcomed a, a shot of vodka. No. All right, uh, we have a question from Lynn. She is asking, do we know which provisions Eleanor initially felt strongly about and which she was eventually convinced to change her mind about? That's a good question. Um, what comes immediately to mind is that one of the, one of the actual changes made during the um, debates in the third committee was that a, uh, a clause was added to the preamble recognizing the equal rights of men and women. It was not Eleanor Roosevelt who pushed for the inclusion of that in the preamble or, or in other articles that she, it was other, there, there weren't a lot of women delegates. Uh, there was an Indian woman um, named Meta M E. HTA, um, and a woman from the Dominican Republic. Um, and it was those women who pushed for, for more recognition of the rights of women. Um, so that's a little surprising, but that's, that, was, uh, that was the case. Great, and then Fred was curious, how many other women were on the UN Commission? Good question. I don't think in the beginning to were, well, well, yes, there was, Meta was on it in the beginning. So there was one other woman. I think there was only one other woman. Okay. And then Lynn had another question. Do we know how much influence there was by public spokespersons such as Gary, Gary Davis on the negotiation of the declaration? such as Gary Davis? G-A-R-R-Y Davis. Hmm. I don't recognize that name. Um, <laughs> a spokesman for whom? Uh, it says a public spokesperson, such as, I guess just generically, was there any uh, by others, public spokespersons? Well, there, 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 there were the, the um, um, the Jews who, who had suffered so much in, during the Holocaust, um, the declaration was extremely important to them and they worked very hard to, to influence what went into the uh, declaration and into the conventions. I mentioned Jacob Blaustein, who was the head of the American Jewish uh, committee um, and he, he was actually, uh, that organization was in San Francisco at the founding of the United Nations. Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't there, but she was, he was there. And he was one of the people who pushed for an inclusion of a uh, Declaration of Human Rights um, in the UN's founding documents. And, um, and then, you know, went on to, as I said, to continue to, to lobby for uh, provisions that were important to the Jews and also for, for the implementation of, of, these, um, of these principles. So, um, but there were other non-governmental organizations also that, that worked um, to, um, to make sure the, the, the declaration reflected their values and the values of, of our um, 
our Bill of Rights, um, but also uh, economic and social rights. Great, and uh, Fred actually just dropped another question. What politicians in the US were the most vocal opponents of the adoption of the declaration? Ooh. Um, well, in the State Department, this is not an answer to the question, but in the State Department it was Robert Lovett, uh, who, um, who was the one who was, he was opposed to any declaration at all. Um, you know, I don't, it doesn't really, I don't remember who, who particularly was, was opposed to it. As I said that, you know, a, 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 a convention, which is a treaty has to go before the Senate. So a president can sign a convention but then it has to be sent to the Senate for ratification. And in the Senate, it requires a two thirds majority. So you can see, you know, with our conservative leading Senate, how difficult it is to get something ratified. A lot of presidents who have signed conventions have not bothered to send them to the Senate because they knew there was no chance of their being ratified. And it would just be, you know, more embarrassing to have it sent there and, and, and voted down, uh, it would be, a, bad for the image of the United States. So the, the presidents would just not send them to, to, the, um, to the Senate. But I, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you who in particular was opposed. Uh, you know, John Foster Dulles, who became Secretary of State, um, you know, under Eisenhower was not a, a great proponent of of either the um, the declaration or the conventions, and uh, so not much progress was made uh, during that period. Great. I actually just got a question that I find very interesting. With all of Eleanor's accomplishments throughout her life, um, with immigrant civil rights and other efforts until the end of her life. What do you think she labeled as her most important achievement? Well, as I said right at the outset, she felt that the, her role in a drafting and adopting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was her greatest achievement. Why was that? Well, um, you can see that the, the difficulty of getting those 18 members of the full commission on human rights to agree on a, the wording of the declaration and then to get it through the third committee and finally through the General Assembly was an extremely challenging task. I don't think anything she did was more difficult than that. And it required all of her skills, you know, all of her tact, her patience, her energy. She was, she was known for, you know, being indefatigable. And, um, you know, she, she could work from early morning until after midnight you know, she said, when I'm engaged in something, I don't get tired. So, so I'm sure the other de delegates were uh, falling asleep when she was still wide awake. Um, so, but the other thing is that the, in the 1930s, in the 1920s and 30s, she was, a, you know, she was an internationalist and she worked with a, a group of women um, who were uh, internationalists who wanted to uh, establish a world court, um, who believed that in the uh, League of Nations, which the United States hadn't joined, um, and who worked uh, for international peace, um, who tried to find a cure for the disease, what they saw as the disease of war. Um, and so all of those things she worked for in the 30s, which weren't achieved, I, I mean, you know, war broke out and atrocities were committed and so on and so forth. The UN offered hope that those things that they had fought for in the 20s and 30s might now be possible, it might be possible to implement those things, to establish international institutions that would help prevent war uh, 
conquer hunger, create better health throughout the world and so forth. So the UN meant enormous amount to her and uh, being able to participate in the drafting of one of its founding documents was a culmination of that long struggle that she'd participated in to, um, to create international institutions which could make the world a better place. Um, so I think that's why it was so, you know, she felt it was her greatest achievement. John, um, thank you for that. Um, we have a few more minutes left, but, and I don't want to leave without us plugging your book. Um, and I'm gonna fix what I put in the chat. Uh, I, I feel so comfortable now. I just called her Eleanor, uh, but it's called Refuge Must Be Given Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, not just Eleanor, but Eleanor Roosevelt, the Jewish plight and the founding of Israel. Can you give us a, um, you know, a, a, a flyby on uh, what, what someone will experience if they uh, pick that up and um, what, what was the impetus for you writing that? Yeah, um, one thing I should say is that it actually is available now. Its publication date was May 15th, but uh, it's already being delivered to people. Um, uh, I have not actually gotten my copy, but friends and relatives have gotten copies of it uh, uh, because my copy comes from the publisher, their copies comes from the distributor. Anyway, it's available from Purdue University Press. Um, you can go to their website and find it easily. Um, and it's a book about um, Eleanor Roosevelt's work during the 30s and 40s on um, trying to open America's doors wider to uh, refugees, particularly Jewish refugees, uh, but we weren't allowing other refugees in either. Um, and, um, and how she uh, also her, her campaigning against anti-Semitism in America, which was um, virulent at the time um, and was one of the reasons we were so reluctant to admit uh, Jewish refugees. Um, and then after the war, uh, she remained very active in refugee issues. As I said, she, um, she debated uh, in the UN the issue of what would happen to the uh, Jews and other refugees in the displaced person camps in Europe. Um, that's really how she made her name internationally. Um, and she lobbied in the United States to pass laws that would admit more refugees after the war. We were still reluctant and opposed. Many Americans were opposed to, to immigration at that time, even though, you know, in the 30s, um, there was the depression and people were out of work. And so they were worried about competition. After the war, we had a booming economy, the expanding economy. So there was less reason to, to exclude people, but, but we, we did, we, we, it was very, she was a very hard struggle to, to, to get a, a, a law passed that admitted more um, refugees. So the other question was, you know, there were 200,000 Jewish refugees in these EP camps. Where were they supposed to go? No one would take them in uh, or only take a few of them in. Most of them wanted to go to Palestine. And uh, she had already become interested in the Jewish settlements in Palestine because her friends like Rose Schneiderman, um, who was head of the Women's Trade Union League, who was not a Zionist, but believed that, um, that the Jews in Europe um, needed, you know, refuge must be, it was her, she who said refuge must be given. It, and if it, it, and the Palestine was the one place where they were really welcomed by the Jewish settlers who were already there. Um, and um, so Eleanor Roosevelt became, um, became a great uh, proponent of immigration to, to Palestine and, and she became world patron of Youth Aliyah, which was um, organization which brought Jewish children, some of them orphans, some of them 
children from families who realized their children had no future in the countries from which they came. And so they put them in the hands of Yitaliyah, who took them to Palestine and later Israel and trained them um, to become useful, productive citizens of this new, new country. So uh, she became world patron. She visited uh, Israel four times to, to visit all the, the, the um, training centers that um, Kibbutzim that uh, Yithalia had supported. Um, and um, she became a great um, promoter of, uh, of Israel. Now that raises human rights issues. Some of you are probably thinking about that human rights issues because for the, you know, she was she was uh, admired for her um, work in drafting the Universal Declaration by people around the world, but not by the Arabs. The Arabs saw that thought that she was a hypocrite that she didn't recognize the rights of of the Palestinian Arabs. And uh, so that's an issue I talk about in the book. Um, and I won't, I won't go any further into it now, but, but it's, it's a very difficult issue to deal with. Um, here was this great champion of human rights and um, she didn't fully recognize the, um, the devastation, devastating result of, um, of the Palestinian Arabs losing their, their lands. Um, mm -hmm. so although she, she was very sympathetic to the refugees themselves and the need to, to resettle them and to um, make sure that they were in good health and they had food and so forth. But politically, she, she, didn't, um, she didn't understand the, she rejected the Arab view of, of the situation. Mm -hmm. So let's. Well, thank you, John. Um, so yes, please everyone um, take a uh, look at our chat. You can find um, his, uh, John's book there and uh, Kelly kindly put a link to where you can pick it up. So that's, uh, we appreciate that Kelly. Um, thank you all for joining us today and particularly thank you, John, for sharing your time and your, your knowledge and uh, your your passion about Eleanor Roosevelt, and I know this was an hour well spent for me learning further about someone who I'm increasingly just growing more and more um, in uh, in admiration of. So, thank you for that. And with you're that, very, um, yeah. you're very welcome. <laughs> it was a pleasure to be here. Well, we're so glad to have you, and um, and we want to thank you all for joining us today. Please um, remember, uh, uh, drop a donation, join on our newsletter, our sign our sign up is on our website, and follow our work. And we'd love to keep uh, presenting these terrific panels and discussions. And so, um, keep following what we're doing. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>